Hey everybody, welcome back to the California Dream. I'm Darren Brown, and this is the weekly roundup for June 19th, 2021. This is Father's Day weekend, so happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. This will be an abbreviated roundup, mostly because I'm in the middle of teaching a very short six-week summer class, which is just heading into the home stretch, so there's a lot to do there. But I just want to hit upon a few major topics for this week. Of course, the big story this week in California is the record heat wave sweeping the Southwest, which is exacerbating our already ongoing drought and increasing the likelihood of another damaging wildfire season. The Guardian reports yesterday that uh, this drought is potentially the worst drought in 1,200 years. So they know this by uh, examining tree rings and other paleoclimate records. And one of the climatologists they quote in this article, which I'll link in the description, she says, the more we see these extreme events piled on top of each other, not just in the Western U.S., but globally, the more I think the reality of climate change becomes inescapable. Well, we'll come back to that in a second. And then she says, we're going to have less water, increased wildfires, and more extreme heat waves. Now, anyone who's uh, lived in California for any length of time knows that these are not new issues. Um, I've lived in California almost all of my life, and it seems like about half of my life, um, we've been dealing with uh, droughts or water issues or you know, wildfires. Um, this is not like something that's just happened the past few years. But when was the last time you heard issues about water or drought or wildfire discussed as a major problem in Congress? Just take a second. Just think if, if you can remember that or even the national media. Do you ever remember those items being talked about in the major national media? I can't really remember the last time. Do you think this is something that is even on the radar in Washington, D.C.? It doesn't seem like it to me. What we do have is a GOP party that seems to be denying the problem. So in an article about a month ago, this was in May 10th, um, this is from the Brookings Institute. Uh, Republicans in Congress are out of step with the American public on climate. What I found interesting was that Republican voters themselves around the country are very slowly starting to come around to understanding this issue. I mean, they still got a long ways to go, but they're starting to change their views. But what is not changing is the representatives in Congress. And this is something that I'm going to come back to again and again, is that the structure of the federal system and the primaries and the two-party system is set up to appeal to the most extreme base of the Republican Party. And so even if you get... Um, a number of Republican voters starting very gradually to come around on the climate issue, that's not going to register in the primaries. And then when you put up a Republican against the Democrat in Republican areas, they're still going to vote for the Republican. And so you get these people who then don't reflect what's, what's changing among the voters. And this is magnified by the effect of the Senate, where the smaller states are overrepresented. So just to give you a couple more examples on this, uh, the Republicans have a new ally to help deliver their global warming message. He's an environmentalist who likes to apologize for the climate scare. And climate scare is in scare quotes. This is from E&E &E News, uh, which reports on energy and environmental issues. So this uh, ally that they talk about is Michael Schellenberger. So Michael Schellenberger, I guess, is the, the guy who delivers the climate message on Fox News and, you know, to the, to the right-wing media. He's not actually an environmentalist. 
He has his background, of course, in public relations. Originally graduated from the Peace and Global Studies program at Earlham College in 1993. And he thinks that fracking is just great. His most recent book came out last year, titled Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. Hmm. Well, maybe he should come to California and live with our drought and wildfires. Maybe he might have a different opinion. Then there is, uh, this past week, Representative Gomert, Louis Gomert of Texas, uh, he had an interesting take about climate science, and um, I'll link to the video on this. This one's uh, hilarious if you can stop from crying. He asked a representative of the U.S. Forest Service if we could combat climate change by altering the orbit of the moon. He said, quote, I was informed by the immediate past director of NASA that they found that the moon's orbit is changing slightly, and so is the Earth's orbit around the sun. We know there's been significant solar flare activity. So is there anything the National Forest Service or BLM can do to change the course of the moon's orbit, sorry, or the Earth's orbit around the sun? Obviously, that would have profound effects on our climate. And... You have to watch the video. You, you need to watch the response, um, the response of this representative from the Forest Service. Um, it's very funny. So anyway, that is, um, that's where the GOP is on climate. And, you know, these are the people that you share a government with. We have representatives and senators who think Trump won the election. We have representatives who think that the January 6th insurrection was um, a false flag instigated by the FBI and carried out by Antifa. Uh, we have a representative who thinks the Jewish space lasers are causing our wildfire problem. And we have a representative who thinks we can address climate change by altering the orbit of the moon. Yeah, these are the people that you share a government with. These are the people that you have to come to consensus with about policy and legislation. Just think about that. Next item I wanted to go over. Um, there seems to be this um, panic, moral panic, um, not so much in California, but in the rest of the country, apparently, over critical race theory. Now. I'm not going to get much into critical race theory. I'm not going to get much into the different 1619 or 1776 or any of those things. I'm just going to say a few brief things. First of all, so if you remember last week, I talked about code words, how, for instance, when, when you hear people use certain words, they, they're not really meaning what it sounds like they're meaning. So, for instance, when they talk about the purity or the quality of the vote, what they're really saying is that only certain people should be able to vote and have a say in who represents them. Or when they talk about um, Democrats bringing communism to America, they, they have no idea what communism means. They're saying something else. So that's kind of what I think is going on here with this uh, critical race theory. The people who are going on and on about this, uh, I, I don't think they have the faintest idea what critical race theory is, uh, this is, you know, this is something that's been around for 50 years. It's an actual academic research program. Um, I'm sure they don't understand the difference between critical race theory and critical race studies. Um, so what exactly are they, are they talking about when they say this, if they don't, they don't really have a clue what this is about? Well, again, I think it's a code word. I think they're using this kind of as an umbrella term for anything about race that makes people uncomfortable. So you don't want to talk about, um, you don't want to talk about slavery, critical race theory. You don't want to talk about um, how we treated Native Americans, critical race theory. You don't want to talk about race riots. You don't want to talk about um, Tulsa or all these other things, critical race theory. So basically, 
it's a way of just completely squashing discussion about anything. And that's what I think is behind it. I don't think it has anything to do with the actual research program that's known as critical race uh, theory or critical race studies. I think that's really what it's about. And it, it's a good idea whenever these kind of panics come up to see uh, where's the money behind this. And I found an article that actually talks about the 1776 commission report. And it goes into where the funding is coming from for this. And uh, it won't be too much of a surprise. So if you look at members of the 1776 commission report, you'll see they tend to have something in common. Uh, they're all funded by a lot of these right-wing think tanks, such as um, the, the Koch Family Foundations, Hoover Institute, Bradley Foundation, um, a lot of these, uh, these right-wing think tanks. And I'll link to the article here. It's a, a guest blog from Inside Higher Ed. Where does the bizarre hysteria about critical race theory come from? Follow the money. Next, I want to direct you to a series of interviews. So Paul Jay, if you're familiar with him, he used to be on a website uh, or a YouTube channel called The Real News Network. I believe it was based out of Baltimore. And he is no longer there, but he has uh, moved to another channel, another network, The Analysis-News. The YouTube channel only has about 15,000 subscribers, but um, I managed to find him because he's, he's a really good uh, journalist and a really good interviewer. And he is in the process of releasing, uh, right now, he's in the middle of releasing these, a nine-part series of interviews with Bill Black. Now, if you've never heard of Bill Black, Bill Black um, was responsible more than anybody else for really going after the bankers in the savings and loan crisis. And he's at the University of Missouri at Kansas City. and He's really an expert on what is called control fraud. Uh, control fraud is really what happened in the 2008 crash. In fact, he was uh, the leading expert for a documentary that I'll talk about later um, sometime called The Con. And this was a documentary that really went into what happened um, about 12 or 13 years ago. And... To cut the story short, what happened uh, in the 2008 crash was not some kind of naturally occurring phenomenon. Um, what they're able to show in this documentary is that this was a deliberate fraud carried out by the major banks. And um, it, it was not some accident. It was d done intentionally. And the difference between the savings and loan crisis and what happened in 2008 is a lot of bankers went to jail in the savings and loan crisis, mainly thanks to Bill Black. And they have not gone to jail now. Nothing has been done. Um, basically, there's been no accountability. And The Con is a um, several-hour documentary series and that really goes over the history of it and explains it. This is a series of interviews just with Bill Black um, where he goes over... Um, many of the same topics. He starts with the savings and loan uh, scandal, and he talks about you know fraud in the banking industry. And these interviews are each almost an hour long. There's going to be nine of them. So this is going to be like eight or nine hours worth of uh, interview. So it's really fascinating. I've watched the first couple, and uh, I would really encourage you to, to, to watch these. If you want to learn a lot about what happened with the financial crash, which is, of course, affected the economy ever since. I will link to this in the description. I'll link to the first part, and from the first part, uh, you can pretty much find the part two, three, and four, and so on from that. And for the last item for today, of course, today is Juneteenth, June 19th, which is now a federal holiday. Uh, I don't know what took you so long, but I wanted to talk a little bit about it. 
So the only thing I wanted to say about this is um, there's this kind of idea that I've heard that um, that the reason that this is the date, June 19th, 1865, is because it took two and a half years for word to reach from Washington, D.C. of the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, I know that communication wasn't as fast back then, but I don't think it took two and a half years to go from Washington, D.C. to Texas. And what the reality is, is uh, a little bit more nuanced. It's not just that word had to reach Texas. Um, It's also that Texas didn't really want to hear the word. Um, What happened was everyone who wanted to keep their slaves or delay the inevitable kind of just went as far west as they could. So... They just went into Texas. And so this was really the, the, the last outpost of slavery. And it wasn't so much, again, that it took that long for word to arrive. It's more that it took that long for the word to be enforced. Okay, so let's just be clear about th- something. Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't that it took two and a half years for them to find out something, to find out some piece of information. It took two and a half years for the Union Army to take authority over Texas and actually have some means of really enforcing the Emancipation Proclamation. So just wanted to you know, be clear about that. Now, another thing I wanted to say about this is, yes, Juneteenth is now a federal holiday, and we should be uh, very happy about that. However... There were 14 Republicans who voted against the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act. And I'm sorry to say two of those representatives are from California. So we got to call these people out. So Doug LaMalfa is a Republican serving in the 1st Congressional District. So um, if you're familiar with the, the numbering of the congressional districts, this is the district that is basically uh, Jefferson. It's the, the most northeastern uh, district. It, uh, it encompasses Butte County, Lassen County, uh, Modoc County, Plumas, Shasta, Sierra. So there's a number of different counties because um, the population is very sparse there. But first congressional district representative voted against it. So uh, we got to do something about getting rid of him. And the other one is somebody a little bit closer to me. This is Tom McClintock. So Tom McClintock is a representative for California's 4th Congressional District. Now, the 4th Congressional District um, covers the Sierra Nevada. It's kind of like from uh, the Truckee area. Um, Alpine, Amador, Calaveras, Tuolumne, El Dorado, those kind of counties. Um, So that's Tom McClintock. So those are the two, Doug LaMalfa and Tom McClintock. So if you're a Californian who lives in either of those congressional districts, uh, you got to do something about that because those guys have got to go. Okay, that's the roundup. And... Have a great Father's Day weekend, and I'll talk to you next week.